children, and nobody ever questions the strong influence of genes on height, yet they vehemently deny any influence of genes on intelligence. There is something curious about heritability. A trait's heritability and its adaptiveness, how important it is for survival and reproductive success, are generally inversely related. The more adaptive the trait is, the more important it is for the organism's survival and reproductive success, the less heritable it is. This is because when a trait is crucial for survival and reproductive success, every individual must have it at the optimal and most efficient level. Evolution cannot allow it to vary across individuals. It is only when a trait is less important for survival and reproductive success that evolution can allow it to vary across individuals. Thus, according to the basic principles of quantitative genetics, the fact that general intelligence is highly heritable suggests that it is not very important for our survival and reproductive success, as I argue throughout the book. How did general intelligence evolve? As I discuss in Chapter 1, evolutionary psychology contends that the human mind consists of evolved psychological mechanisms. Evolved psychological mechanisms are domain-specific. It means that these evolved and innate solutions to adaptive problems each operate only in their own specific narrow domains of life. For example, the cheater detection mechanism, which was among the very first evolved psychological mechanisms to be discovered, operates only in the domain of social exchange. It helps us detect potential cheaters when they try to cheat us out of a fair exchange. But the cheater detection mechanism does not help us, nor is it operative in any other domains of life. It does not help us, for example, learn our native language. It does not help us decide how to allocate limited parental resources among our children. In other words, which of our children to favor unconsciously. Yes, parents do have favorites among their children. And it does not help us recognize familiar faces of the people we know. By the same token, the language acquisition device, which helps us learn our native language from our mothers when we are small children, does not help us detect cheaters in social exchange, decide how to allocate parental resources, or recognize familiar faces. In fact, it does not help us do anything except for the one task of learning our native language. It does not even help us learn second and third languages as adults, which is why learning a foreign language is so much more difficult than learning to speak our native language as a child, which comes very naturally and easily to us because we have the innate ability to do so. Evolved psychological mechanisms are domain-specific because adaptive problems, which they are designed to solve, are domain-specific. All problems of survival and reproduction happen in specific domains. There were no general problems that did not happen in a specific context for our ancestors to solve. Evolution did not give us a domain general solution like a computer because there were no domain general problems like an IQ test in the ancestral environment. However, if the contents of the human brain are domain-specific, how can evolutionary psychology explain general intelligence, which is seemingly domain-general, not domain-specific? Isn't general intelligence a domain-general solution? General intelligence thus posed a significant theoretical problem for evolutionary psychology for a long time. How can evolutionary psychology explain the evolution of general intelligence? I believe that what is now known as general intelligence may have originally evolved as a domain-specific adaptation to deal with evolutionarily novel, non-reoccurrent problems. Now what does that mean? The Pleistocene Epoch, between 1.6 million and 10,000 years ago during which humans evolved, was a period of extraordinary constancy and continuity. Nothing much happened for more than a million years. Our ancestors were hunter-gatherers on the African savanna all of their lives. Their grandparents were hunter-gatherers on the African savanna all their lives. Their parents were hunter-gatherers on the African savanna all their lives. Their children were hunter-gatherers on the African savanna all their lives. Their grandchildren were hunter-gatherers on the African savanna all their lives. This kind of constancy is difficult for us to fathom. 
In our grandparents' generation, most people were farmers. Now, very few people are. In our parents' generation, most people were factory workers. Now, very few people are. Now, most of us, regardless of our specific occupation, conduct our business and trade at least partly on our computer, a device that did not exist in our grandparents' or even our parents' generation. It is against the backdrop of the extreme stability of our ancestors' environment during the Pleistocene Epoch that all of our psychological adaptations evolved. For instance, those who had a taste for sweet and fatty food during the Pleistocene Epoch lived longer and reproduced more successfully by acquiring more calories than those who did not have such a taste for sweet or fatty food. Or, those who preferred a certain landscape for their habitat lived longer and reproduced more successfully by avoiding potential predators in hiding than those who did not have such a preference. The evolution of psychological mechanisms, or any adaptation, physical or psychological, assumes a stable environment. Because evolution usually takes place very, very slowly, over tens and hundreds of thousands of years, solutions cannot evolve in the form of psychological mechanisms if the problems keep changing. The fact that we have so many evolved psychological mechanisms today is testimony to the extraordinary stability and constancy of the ancestral environment. Technically, the speed of evolution depends on the strength of selection pressure how crucial it is for survival and reproduction to solve a given adaptive problem. The rate of evolution of a trait is proportional to the adaptiveness of the trait, the correlation between possessing the trait and being able to reproduce. For example, if cosmic rays from an explosion of a nearby supernova render all but redheads sterile, then in just one generation everyone on Earth will be a redhead because no one else will be able to reproduce. But selection pressures are usually much weaker. For example, the cosmic rays will allow redheads to reproduce at a 5% greater rate than everyone else. So, evolution of most traits take many, many generations. Because adaptive problems in the ancestral environment remained more or the same generation after generation, our evolved psychological mechanisms were sufficient for our ancestors to solve them. In this sense, our ancestors did not really have to think in order to solve their adaptive problems. They didn't have to think, for instance, what was good to eat. All they had to do was to eat and keep eating what tasted good to them sweet and fatty foods that contained high calories, and they lived long and remained healthy. People who preferred the wrong kind of food, like brightly colored mushrooms or an entirely vegetarian diet, died off before leaving too many offspring, and we did not inherit our psychological mechanisms from them. All the thinking had already been done by evolution, so to speak, which then equipped our ancestors with the correct solutions in the form of innate, domain-specific psychological mechanisms. For the most part, our ancestors never had to figure out problems on their own. Even in the extreme continuity and constancy of the ancestral environment, however, there were likely occasional problems that were evolutionarily novel and non-reoccurrent, which required our ancestors to think and reason in order to solve. Such problems may have included, for example, number 1. Lightning has struck a tree near the camp and set it on fire. The fire is now spreading to the dry underbrush. What should I do? How could I stop the spread of the fire? How could I and my family escape it? Since, as they say, lightning never strikes the same place twice, this is guaranteed to be a non-recurrent problem. Number two. We are in the middle of the severest drought in as long as anyone can remember. Nuts and berries at our normal places of gathering, which are usually plentiful, are not growing at all, and animals are scarce as well. We are running out of food because none of our normal sources of food are working. What else can we eat? What else is safe to eat? How else can we procure food? Number three, a flash flood has caused the river to swell to several times its normal width, and I'm trapped on one side of it while my entire band is on the other side. It is imperative that I rejoin them soon. How could I cross the rapid river? Should I walk across it, or should I construct some sort of buoyant vehicle to use to get across it? If so, what kind of material should I use? Wood? Stones? 
To the extent that these evolutionarily novel, non-reoccurrent problems happened frequently enough in the ancestral environment, a different problem each time, and had serious enough consequences for survival and reproduction, then any genetic mutation that allowed its carriers to think and reason would have been selected for, and what we now call general intelligence could have evolved as a domain-specific psychological mechanism for the domain of evolutionarily novel, non-reoccurrent problems which did not exist in the ancestral environment and which there are no dedicated psychological modules to solve. From this perspective, general intelligence may have become universally important in modern life, only because our current environment is almost entirely evolutionarily novel. In the ancestral environment, general intelligence might have been no more important than any other domain-specific evolved psychological mechanism, like the cheater detection mechanism or the language acquisition device. General intelligence helped our ancestors only in the very narrow domain of evolutionary novelty. Evolutionarily novel problems were by definition few and far between in the ancestral environment, just as the cheater detection mechanism helped them only in the very narrow domain of social exchange and the language acquisition device helped them only in the very narrow domain of the native language acquisition. General intelligence became more important than other evolved psychological mechanisms only because our environment has changed so radically in the last 10,000 years and most of the problems we face today are evolutionarily novel. The importance of general intelligence may itself be evolutionarily novel. This theory suggests that more intelligent individuals are better than less intelligent individuals at solving problems only if they are evolutionarily novel. More intelligent individuals are not better than less intelligent individuals at solving evolutionarily familiar problems that our ancestors routinely had to solve. The theory suggests that the performance of general intelligence as but one domain-specific psychological mechanism is independent of the performances of all the other domain-specific psychological mechanisms. I review some of the evidence for this theory of the evolution of general intelligence in the next chapter. Cognitive Classes before we leave this chapter on intelligence, I'd like to introduce the concept of cognitive classes, which I use frequently throughout the rest of the book. It is a way of grouping individuals into five ordinal categories by their intelligence, from highest to lowest. This is a classification system that other scholars have invented and I have used before in my own work. The labels for the cognitive classes are used merely as a convenient shorthand without any connotations. Very bright, IQ greater than 125, roughly 5% of the U.S. population. Bright, 110 lesser than IQ, lesser than 125, roughly 20% of the U.S. population. Normal, 90 less than IQ, 110 roughly 50% of the U.S. population. Dull, 75 less than IQ, less than 90, roughly 20% of the U.S. population. Very dull, 75 less than IQ, roughly 5% of the U.S. population. Here is a way to give you a quick flavor of what these cognitive classes mean. Among white Americans, 75% of those who earn a bachelor's degree are very bright. None are very dull. In contrast, 64% of those who drop out of high school are very dull. None are very bright. Chapter 4. When Intelligence Matters and When It Doesn't. The Savannah IQ Interaction Hypothesis. The logical intersection of the Savannah Principle discussed in Chapter 2 and the theory of the evolution of general intelligence discussed in Chapter 3 suggests a qualification of the Savannah Principle. If general intelligence evolved to deal with evolutionarily novel problems, then the human brain's difficulty in comprehending and dealing with entities and situations that did not exist in the ancestral environment proposed in Chapter 3 suggests a qualification of the Savannah Principle. 
If general intelligence evolved to deal with evolutionarily novel problems, then the human brain's difficulty in comprehending and dealing with entities and situations that did not exist in the ancestral environment proposed in the Savannah Principle should interact with general intelligence. In other words, the Savannah Principle should hold stronger among less intelligent individuals than among more intelligent individuals. More intelligent individuals should be better able to comprehend and deal with evolutionarily novel but not evolutionarily familiar entities and situations than less intelligent individuals. So, I now propose the Savannah IQ Interaction Hypothesis, or the Hypothesis. The hypothesis qualifies and elaborates on the Savannah Principle by introducing intelligence and how it modifies the operation of the Savannah Principle. The Savannah IQ Interaction Hypothesis Less intelligent individuals have greater difficulty comprehending and dealing with evolutionarily novel entities and situations that did not exist in the ancestral environment than more intelligent individuals. In contrast, general intelligence does not affect individuals' ability to comprehend and deal with evolutionarily familiar entities and situations that existed in the ancestral environment. Recall the definition of comprehension from Chapter 2 as the true, logical, and scientifically and empirically accurate understanding of how something works. Now I am going to review the empirical evidence for the Savannah IQ interaction hypothesis in many different domains of life. Back to TV Friends. In Chapter 2, I discuss my 2002 study which suggests that people may have some implicit difficulty distinguishing their TV friends, characters that they repeatedly see on TV, from their real friends. The more they watch certain types of TV shows, the more satisfied they become with their friendships, just as they do if they have more friends or socialize with them more frequently. This makes perfect sense from the perspective of the Savannah Principle. Because there were no realistic electronic or photographic images of other humans in the ancestral environment, the human brain has difficulty with such images. Since all realistic images of other humans in the ancestral environment were other humans, the human brain implicitly assumes that any such images of other humans who don't attempt to kill or maim them, which very few TV characters do, are their friends. In 2006, after I formulated the initial ideas behind the hypothesis, I reanalyzed the same data from the general social surveys to see if individuals' IQ was related to their implicit tendency to confuse TV friends and real friends. And it was. This tendency, which I initially thought, according to the Savannah Principle, was a universal human trait in 2002, appears to be limited to men and women below median intelligence, consistent with the Savannah IQ interaction hypothesis. Those who are above median in intelligence do not report greater satisfaction with friendships as a function of watching more TV. Only those below median intelligence do. This seems to suggest that the evolutionary constraints on the brain predicted by the Savannah Principle, whereby individuals have implicit difficulty with recognizing realistic electronic images on TV for what they are, appear to be weaker or altogether absent among more intelligent individuals. Since truly enjoying the experience of watching TV requires suspension of disbelief and not really understanding that characters repeatedly seen on the screen are highly paid actors hired to play scripted roles, this new finding can potentially explain why less intelligent individuals tend to enjoy the experience of watching TV more than more intelligent individuals do. Of course, just like everything else I say in this book, the negative association between general intelligence and the enjoyment of TV is an empirical generalization, for which there are many exceptions. I personally happen to love watching TV myself. However, among my highly intelligent academic colleagues, there are many who do not watch television at all. Some don't even own a television set. I'm often frustrated with them because I have nothing to talk to them about if they don't watch television at all. I share no common points of reference with such people. 
Like the comedy writer Tina Fey, I believe that American television is one of the greatest things about the country, and I feel sorry for people who cannot appreciate its many wonderful programs. Nevertheless, the Savannah IQ interaction hypothesis can explain why many intelligent people do not watch television at all. We all know people who have a tendency to talk back and speak to characters they see while they are watching TV or movies. I believe this habit also stems from their implicit confusion of TV friends and real friends. The confusion of realistic electronic images of other human beings on the screen and real human beings. I would, therefore, predict that less intelligent individuals are more likely to talk back and speak to TV and movie screens, and further that these are precisely the people who enjoy watching TV and movies more than others do. Less intelligent individuals are less likely truly to comprehend electronic images on the screen and more likely to forget unconsciously that they are not real live human beings who can hear us when we talk back to them. Back to Pornography in Chapter 2, I explain that men's and women's brains cannot truly comprehend pornography. Realistic photographic and videographic images of sexually aroused men and women because no such thing existed in the ancestral environment. The Savannah Principle can explain why men and women confuse porn stars with real potential sex partners just as they confuse TV friends with real friends. Now, the hypothesis would predict that such confusion of porn stars with real potential sex partners might interact with general intelligence, just as does the confusion of TV friends with real friends. In the first independent empirical confirmation of the hypothesis, conducted by researchers other than myself, George A. Romero and Aaron T. Getz, Two young evolutionary psychologists at California State University Fullerton demonstrate that this indeed is the case. In their survey, Romero and Getz measure three things from their male respondents. 1. Their perception of women's sexuality and sexual behavior. 2. Their consumption of pornography. And 3. Their general intelligence. Their analysis that there is a positive association between men's consumption of pornography and how sexually promiscuous they think women are. In other words, how likely they think women in real life behave like porn stars. The more frequently they watch porn, the more they believe that women are sexually more promiscuous, have a large number of sex partners and one-night stands, and enjoy having casual sex, giving oral sex, receiving anal sex, and having threesomes, just as women typically do in porn movies. However, this confusion of real women and porn stars happens only if the men are less intelligent, at least one standard deviation below the mean, not if they are of average or above average intelligence, at least one standard deviation above the mean. This is a brilliant empirical demonstration of the hypothesis in operation. Men's brains confuse real women and porn stars, thereby believing that real women act like porn stars by being sexually promiscuous and enjoying unusual sexual acts, but only if they are of below average intelligence. Romero and Getz further demonstrate that once they control for general intelligence, the consumption of pornography alone does not increase men's tendency toward this confusion. One must simultaneously have below average intelligence and consume a large quantity of pornography in order to confuse real women with porn stars. The Failures of the Truly Gifted Perhaps nothing illustrates the operation of the hypothesis and the sharp distinction between the evolutionarily novel and evolutionarily familiar domains of life more clearly than the profile of the truly gifted. The study of mathematically precocious youth tracks the lives of more than 5,000 individuals who have been identified as truly gifted in the SAT talent search. Most people take the SAT in the last year of high school at age 17. Participants in the talent search take it in the 7th or 8th grade before the age of 13. If they score within the top 0.01%, 
top one in 10,000, for their age by scoring either more than 700 out of 800 on the SAT Mathematical Reasoning Ability or more than 630 on the SAT Verbal Reasoning Ability, they are included in the study. Their IQ is therefore higher than 155. The SAT is considered to be a reasonable IQ test, a test of reasoning ability, not of acquired knowledge, while the ACT is more an achievement test of acquired knowledge. According to the ACT's own website, the ACT is an achievement test, measuring what a student has learned in school. The SAT is more of an aptitude test, testing reasoning and verbal abilities. As you might expect, these individuals of extraordinarily high intelligence achieve equally extraordinary success in the evolutionarily novel domains of formal education and paid employment in the capitalist economy. More than half of them, 51.7% of men and 54.3% of women, have earned a doctorate, Ph.D., MD or JD compared to the population baseline in the US of 1%. An additional 5.3% of them have earned an MBA. All but one of them in the top 10 US programs. Nearly half, 45.8% of them are university professors, engineers, or scientists. An additional 13.6% are in medicine or law. More than a fifth, 21.7% of those in tenure-track positions in the top 50 U.S. universities are already full professors in their early 30s. It is virtually unheard of for someone to achieve the rank of full professor in their early 30s in any university, let alone in a top 50 U.S. university. More than a third of the men and about a fifth of the women earn more than $100,000 a year in 2003-2004 in their early 30s. Yes, in their early 30s. Additionally, 17.8% of the men and 4.3% of the women have earned patents compared to the population baseline in the U.S. of 1%. No matter how you slice it, there is no question that these individuals in the study of mathematically precocious youth go on to experience tremendous success in life. Measured by their educational achievement, professional careers, income, and creativity. All of these, however, are evolutionarily novel areas of life, which our ancestors did not have more than 10,000 years ago. How do the same individuals with IQs higher than 155 fare in evolutionarily familiar areas of life? Mating and parenting are eminently evolutionarily familiar domains of life. Despite the cumbersome interventions of modern inventions, condoms, sperm banks, internet porn, we still mate pretty much the same way as our ancestors did 10,000 years ago. Sexual courtship today still involves initial visual and chemical attraction, verbal and physical interaction, mutual mate choice based on social status, physical attractiveness, and moral character as clues to good genes and parental abilities, foreplay, copulation, positive or negative reaction to the mate choice by friends and family, etc. And we still have children as our ancestors did then. Children today, as then, are raised by pair-bonded couples, single mothers, and their kin, biological mothers and stepfathers, etc. Few other domains of life today are as evolutionarily familiar as marriage and parenting, so the hypothesis would predict that more intelligent individuals do not fare better than less intelligent individuals in the domains of marriage and parenting. This indeed appears to be the case. In stark contrast to their stellar success in education and employment, the participants in the study of mathematically precocious youth do not do very well in the evolutionarily familiar domains of marriage and parenting. For example, 64.9% of the men and 69% of the women remain childless at age 33 compared to the population baseline of 26.4% in the age group 30 to 34. The majority of parents only have one child. 
As a result, the mean number of children is 0.61 for men and 0.44 for women, compared to the population baseline of 1.59 for women in the age group 30 to 30. Despite their extraordinarily high general intelligence, these men and women seem to lag behind everyone else in the evolutionarily familiar domains of marriage and parenting. The fact that truly gifted individuals have no particular advantage, and often disadvantage, in such evolutionarily familiar domains as mating is illustrated by the following exchange between Stephen Hawking and Larry King. Hawking appeared on Larry King Live Weekend on Christmas Day, 1999, on the eve of the new millennium when the following exchange took place. Larry King, what, Professor, puzzles you the most? What do you think about the most? Stephen Hawking, women. Larry King, welcome aboard. The hypothesis would indeed predict that the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at the University of Cambridge, a post once held by Isaac Newton, who is putatively the most intelligent person in the United Kingdom today and can figure out the origin and the destiny of the universe, has no particular advantage in evolutionarily familiar domains of life such as mating over someone like Larry King, who has only a high school education and incidentally has had seven wives and five children. What about the rest of us? The sharp contrast between great success in evolutionarily novel domains and great failures in evolutionarily familiar domains for the very intelligent is not limited to the truly gifted in the study of mathematically precocious youth. General intelligence affects life outcomes in virtually every area and throughout the entire life. From schooling to employment to crime and welfare, dependency to civility and citizenship, not only do more intelligent individuals achieve more desirable outcomes, but general intelligence almost always has a linear positive effect on the desirability of the life outcomes. The more intelligent the individuals, the more desirable the life outcomes. Marriage and parenting are among the very few exceptions to this pattern in a comprehensive review of American life. In fact, very bright individuals are the least likely to marry of all the cognitive classes. Recall their definition of cognitive classes at the end of Chapter 3. Only 67% of these very bright white Americans marry before the age of 30 whereas between 72% and 81% of those in other cognitive classes marry before 30. The mean age of first marriage among the very bright whites is 25.4, whereas it is 21.3 among the very dull individuals and 21.5 among the dull individuals. The more intelligent you are, the later you marry. The pattern is similar in parenting. For example, general intelligence does not confer advantages in giving birth to healthy babies. For example, 5% of white babies born to very bright mothers suffer from low birth weight, compared to 1.6% of those born to bright mothers and 3.2% of those born to normal mothers. Only babies born to dull mothers, 7.2%, and very dull mothers, 5.7%, fare worse. The lack of IQ advantage continues later in the childhood. Very bright mothers are more likely to have children who are behind in motor and social development or have the worst behavioral problems. Specifically, 10% of children born to very bright white mothers are in the bottom 10% of the motor and social development index compared to 5% of those born to bright mothers and 6% of those born to normal mothers. Similarly, 11% of children born to very bright mothers find themselves in the bottom 10% of the behavioral problems index compared to 6% of those born to bright mothers and 10% of those born to normal mothers. It is important to note that the problems suffered by children born to very bright mothers are not just social and behavioral, for which there might be varying and changing cultural definitions of what constitutes normal.
but are also physical, such as birth weight and motor development, for which the criteria of normal development are objective and invariant. Now, since very bright white women marry later, and thus give birth to their babies at older ages compared to other mothers, perhaps some of these physical and behavioral problems of their children may be attributable to their older maternal age at birth, or the greater possibility of harmful mutations in the sperm of older men. But this is precisely my point. Women with higher intelligence are not using their intelligence to marry early and have healthier children, which are the direct means toward achieving reproductive success. More intelligent individuals are more likely to receive more education and earn more money, both of which are evolutionarily novel, but they are certainly not more likely to achieve the evolutionarily familiar goals of marriage and reproduction. This has led some scholars to muse, can mothers be too smart for their own good? The exception that proves the rule. Evolutionarily novel elements in mating and parenting. This is not to argue, however, that intelligent people are not better mates or parents in general today. Intelligent individuals do make better mates and parents in some ways in the current evolutionarily novel environment. For one thing, more intelligent individuals universally attain more desirable outcomes in all evolutionarily novel domains, such as education, economy, criminal justice, even health and longevity in contemporary society. More educated, wealthier, healthier parents who avoid trouble with the law undoubtedly do make better parents today. One need go no farther than to recall the news story from many years ago of an illiterate teenage mother whose baby died of dehydration because the mother could not read the instructions for how to make the baby formula and instead fed the dry powder to the baby as is, without first dissolving it in water. Note, however, that this tragedy happened precisely because it involved written instructions for making a baby formula an evolutionarily novel stimulus about an evolutionarily novel product. My contention is that even this mother may have done fine raising her children in the ancestral environment, where child-rearing most likely did not require general intelligence, as all the answers necessary for parenting would have been provided by other evolved psychological mechanisms. In the ancestral environment, one was illiterate. Modern means of contraception are another evolutionarily novel element in the evolutionarily familiar domain of mating and parenting. In the ancestral environment, our ancestors probably mated all the time, with pregnancy and lactation, lactational amenorrhea, serving as the only natural means of contraception besides abstinence. As a result, our ancestors invariably produced a larger number of offspring than we do today but many of them died in infancy due to infectious diseases, malnutrition, and other natural causes, including predation by humans and other animals. The average number of offspring surviving to sexual maturity in the ancestral environment might not have been much larger than it is today. So while mating and parenting are evolutionarily familiar, voluntary control of fertility through contraception, such as condoms or the pill, is evolutionarily novel. So, the hypothesis would predict that more intelligent individuals are better able to control their fertility voluntarily through artificial means of contraception than less intelligent individuals. This indeed appears to be the case. Among contemporary Americans in the GSS data, the association between the lifetime number of sex partners and the number of children is positive among less intelligent individuals, who are below the median in verbal intelligence, but negative among more intelligent individuals, who are above the median in verbal intelligence. The more sex partners less intelligent individuals have, the more children they have as a natural consequence of greater sexual activity with more partners. In sharp contrast, the more sex partners more intelligent individuals have, the fewer children they have. You cannot have fewer children on average by having more sex partners unless you employ effective contraception. 
Figure 4.1 shows the partial association after controlling for age, race, sex, education, marital status, and religion between the lifetime number of sex partners and the number of children among individuals who are below the median in verbal intelligence. As you can see, the relationship is positive as indicated by the regression line with an incline. Figure 4.2 presents the same relationship among individuals who are above the median in verbal intelligence. Here, the relationship between the lifetime number of sex partners and the number of children is negative, as indicated by the regression line with a decline. The contrast between these two graphs suggests that more intelligent Americans are indeed more efficient in employing evolutionarily novel, modern means of contraception than their less intelligent counterparts. Intelligence and Interpersonal Relationships Interpersonal relationships are an eminently, evolutionarily familiar domain of life. Even in the ancestral environment, our ancestors had friends, allies, and enemies that they had to deal with. They also had parents, children, siblings, and other relatives. There is nothing evolutionarily novel about interacting with these categories of people. In addition, it was very important in the ancestral environment, as it is now, to maintain good relations with these categories of people, except perhaps for enemies. Reliable friends and allies are crucial in survival and reproductive success, and investing in kin is a very important means of increasing reproductive success. So, the hypothesis would predict that general intelligence does not have any effect on individuals' ability to maintain interpersonal relationships with these evolutionarily familiar categories of people. Survey data from the United States support this prediction of the hypothesis. While more intelligent Americans socialize with their friends significantly more frequently than their less intelligent counterparts, intelligence does not seem to improve interpersonal relationships with other evolutionarily familiar categories of people. In fact, more intelligent individuals socialize with neighbors, siblings, and other relatives significantly less frequently than less intelligent individuals. Investing in kin is one of the important means of increasing reproductive success, yet more intelligent Americans seem less able to do so than less intelligent individuals. Intelligence and Wayfinding In the hunter-gatherer life of our ancestors on the African savanna, navigation and wayfinding was an essential skill, on which their very survival depended. After a long hunting or gathering trip, which could sometimes last for days, our ancestors had to find their way home without relying on maps, street signs, artificial landmarks, and the satellite navigation devices. Those who could not find their way home from their trips probably faced certain death. I would therefore expect navigation and wayfinding to be an evolutionarily familiar task, for which there is an evolved psychological mechanism and the hypothesis would predict that general intelligence is independent of wayfinding abilities. A couple of studies support this prediction of the hypothesis. In a highly ingenious experiment, researchers at York University in Canada took participants on a meandering journey through a wooded area, without any visible landmarks or maps, and asked them, at predetermined locations, to point to the direction of the origin. The participants must then lead the researchers back to the origin. In this study, the participants' wayfinding ability had no correlation at all with their general intelligence, measured by Raven's progressive matrices, which, as discussed in Chapter 3, is the best single measure of general intelligence. Researchers at the University of Arizona replicated the Canadian study in virtual reality. Their participants navigated in computer-generated rooms displayed on a computer screen by way of a joystick and had to find an invisible target placed somewhere in the room on the floor. They got a beep when they initially, unknowingly, walked over the invisible target and then must find it again and again in the same room by navigating to the same location in the room. The researchers' data showed that the participants' general intelligence had no effect on their ability to learn their way around the rooms and return to the invisible target. 
They concluded that the individual's ability at spatial navigation and general intelligence were largely independent. Given that more intelligent people tend to do virtually everything better than less intelligent people, their distinct lack of advantage in wayfinding is noteworthy. Intelligence and Exercise As hunters, our ancestors engaged in constant physical activities. Their active, nomadic lifestyle combined with their limited caloric intake meant that obesity was probably very rare in the ancestral environment. And most of our ancestors maintained a healthy, active lifestyle by our contemporary standards. It means that regular exercise, for its own sake, that is, exercising in order to stay healthy and control weight, is probably evolutionarily novel, and the hypothesis would therefore predict that more intelligent individuals are more likely to engage in regular exercise today than less intelligent individuals. A couple of recent studies show that this indeed appears to be the case. In one study, the frequency of exercise is significantly positively associated with general intelligence. In another, individuals who can successfully maintain a regular exercise schedule are more intelligent than those who are unsuccessful by more than one full standard deviation, 122.50 versus 106.25. And this is not because intelligence is associated with conscientiousness. It appears that more intelligent individuals are more likely to adopt the evolutionarily novel lifestyle of regular exercise for its own sake. Of course, more intelligent individuals are more likely to have white-collar desk jobs that are more physically sedentary, whereas less intelligent individuals are more likely to have blue-collar jobs that are physically more active. Thus, more intelligent individuals may need to exercise more than less intelligent individuals. However, in the first study, education, income, and work status are all statistically controlled, and the participants in the second study are all college students, 86.3% of whom are female, who are less likely to have blue-collar jobs. So the effect of intelligence on voluntary physical exercise appears to be genuine, but more research is necessary to arrive at a more firm conclusion. From the hypothesis to the paradox. The intelligence paradox on individual preferences and values. I now switch from the discussion of the Savannah IQ interaction hypothesis to the central idea in this book which I call the intelligence paradox. The intelligence paradox is the application of the hypothesis to the specific domain of individual preferences and values. It explains how general intelligence affects and influences such preferences and values. Evolutionarily novel entities and situations that more intelligent individuals are better able to comprehend and deal with may include ideas and lifestyles which may form the basis of their values and preferences. It would be difficult for individuals to prefer or value something that they cannot truly comprehend. However, comprehension does not equal preference. While not everyone who comprehends certain entities and situations would thereby acquire preferences for them, I assume some would, whereas very few, if any, who do not comprehend them would acquire preferences for them. My assumption is that individuals only prefer or value things that they can truly comprehend. Thus, comprehension is a necessary but not sufficient condition for preference. Applied to the domain of preferences and values, the hypothesis may therefore suggest what more or less intelligent individuals hold as their preferences and values. Hence, I propose the intelligence paradox. The intelligence paradox. More intelligent individuals are more likely to acquire and espouse evolutionarily novel preferences and values that did not exist in the ancestral environment, and thus our ancestors did not have, than less intelligent individuals. In contrast, general intelligence has no effect on the acquisition and espousal of evolutionarily familiar preferences and values that existed in the ancestral environment, and thus our ancestors had.
Recall from chapter 1 that by natural I mean that for which we as a human species are evolutionarily designed, and by unnatural I mean that for which we as a human species are not evolutionarily designed. Thus, another way to express the intelligence paradox is that more intelligent individuals are more likely to acquire and espouse unnatural preferences and values which we are not evolutionarily designed to have. Herein lies the essence of the paradox. More intelligent individuals are more likely to go against their biological design, escape their evolutionary constraints and limitations on their brains, and hence have unnatural and often biologically stupid preferences and values. Yes, more intelligent individuals are more likely to be stupid and do stupid things. In the remainder of the book, I talk about various applications and manifestations of the intelligence paradox with regard to numerous evolutionarily familiar and novel preferences and values. This is where intelligence research meets the problem of values. Chapter 5 Why Liberals Are More Intelligent Than Conservatives What is Liberalism? It is difficult to provide a precise definition of a whole school of political ideology like liberalism or conservatism. To make matters worse, what passes as liberalism or conservatism varies by place and time. The Liberal Democratic Party in the United Kingdom is middle of the road, while the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan is conservative. Most conservatives in the UK and Europe are far more liberal than liberal democrats in the US. The political philosophy which originally emerged as liberalism during the Enlightenment is now called classic liberalism or libertarianism and represents the polar opposite of what is now called liberalism in the United States. In this book, as elsewhere in my work, I adopt the contemporary American definition of liberalism. I provisionally define liberalism, as opposed to conservatism, as the genuine concern for the welfare of genetically unrelated others and the willingness to contribute larger proportions of private resources for the welfare of such others. In the modern political and economic context, this willingness usually translates into paying higher proportions of individual incomes and taxes toward the government and its social welfare programs. Liberals prefer higher taxes and income transfers to achieve equality of outcomes, while conservatives believe in equality of unities, egalitarianism, and are happy with inequality of outcomes, as long as there is equality of opportunities. Liberals believe in equality of outcomes, equality, and prefer any means to achieve it. Defined as such, liberalism is evolutionarily novel. Our ancestors were not liberal in the contemporary American sense. Humans, like all other living species, are designed by evolution to be altruistic toward their genetic kin, their friends, and allies with whom they engage in repeated social exchange and members of their dem a group of intermarrying individuals or ethnic group. Yes, it has been mathematically proven that humans are evolutionarily designed to be ethnocentric. The mathematical sociologist Joseph M. Whitmire has shown that any individual tendency to benefit those whom one might marry or those whose children one's children might marry or those whose grandchildren one's grandchildren might marry, in other words, favoritism toward members of an intermarrying group of people known as the DEM or, in short, ethnocentrism, will be evolutionarily selected. But humans are not designed to be altruistic toward an indefinite number of complete strangers whom they are not likely ever to meet or exchange with. This is largely because our ancestors lived in a small band of about 150 genetically related individuals all their lives and large cities and nations with thousands and millions of people are themselves evolutionarily novel. But how do we really know that our ancestors were not liberals? In order to make reasonable inferences about what values our ancestors might have held during the course of human evolution, I have relied on two sources. 
First, I have consulted the ten-volume compendium, the Encyclopedia of World Cultures, which extensively describes all human cultures known to anthropology, more than 1,500 in great detail. Second, I have consulted five different extensive monograph-length ethnographies of traditional hunter-gatherer pastoral and horticultural societies around the world. While contemporary hunter-gatherer societies are not exactly the same as our ancestors during the Pleistocene Epoch, they are the best analog that we have available for close examination and are thus often used for the purpose of making inferences about our ancestral life. These ethnographic sources make it clear that while sharing of resources, especially food, with other members of their own tribe is quite common and often expected among hunter-gatherers, and while trade with neighboring tribes may have taken place, there is no evidence that people in contemporary hunter-gatherer bands freely share resources with members of other tribes. Because all members of a hunter-gatherer tribe are genetic kin for men or friends and allies for life for women, sharing of resources among them does not qualify as an expression of liberalism as defined above. It may, therefore, be reasonable to infer from these ethnographic accounts that while sharing of food and other resources with genetic kin may be part of universal human nature, sharing of the same resources with total strangers whom one has never met or is not likely ever to meet is not part of evolved human nature. The intelligence paradox would therefore predict that more intelligent individuals are more likely to espouse liberal political ideology than less intelligent individuals. Are liberals more intelligent than conservatives? This indeed appears to be the case. Even when statistically controlling for such relevant factors and potential confounds as age, race, education, income, and religion, more intelligent children are more likely to grow up to become more liberal than less intelligent children. Intelligence measured in junior high and high school strongly predicts adult political ideology seven years later. The more intelligent American adolescents are in junior high and high school the more liberal they become as young adults. Figure 5.1 shows that young adults in their early 20s who identify themselves as very conservative have the average adolescent IQ of 94.82 in junior high and high school, whereas young adults who identify themselves as very liberal have the average adolescent IQ of 106.42 and the association between adult political ideology and adolescent IQ is monotonic. As one increases, the other steadily increases as well. As a mean difference between two large categories of individuals, the 11-point difference in childhood IQ between very liberal and very conservative young American adults is very large and statistically significant. The probability that the results in the above figure can happen by chance when there is actually no association between intelligence and liberalism is less than 1 in 100,000. Even though past studies show that women are more liberal than men and that blacks are more liberal than whites, the statistical analysis shows that the effect of childhood intelligence on adult political ideology is twice as strong as the effect of sex or race. The analyses of both ad health and GSS data confirm the prediction of the intelligence paradox that more intelligent individuals are more likely to acquire and espouse the evolutionarily novel value of liberalism, whereas less intelligent individuals are more likely to acquire and espouse the evolutionarily familiar value of conservatism. But the association between intelligence and political ideology is not limited to the United States. For example, even though there are no liberals and conservatives in the American sense in the United Kingdom, by the American standard, everybody in the United Kingdom is a socialist, and there is very little substantive political disagreement among British citizens. 
a longitudinal study of a large nationally representative sample of British citizens shows that British children who are more intelligent at ages 5 and 10 are more likely to vote for either the Green Party or the Liberal Democratic Party at age 34. However, because British political parties are not as different from each other on the liberal conservative dimension as American political parties are, I am not sure what these results mean in the context of the intelligence paradox. Incidentally, the empirical finding that liberals are on average more intelligent than conservatives substantiates one of the persistent complaints among conservatives. Conservatives often complain that liberals control the media or show business or academia or some other social institutions. Intelligence paradox can explain why conservatives are correct in their complaints. Liberals do control the media or show business or academia among other institutions because apart from a few areas in life, such as business, where countervailing circumstances may prevail, liberals control most institutions. They control the institutions not because they're liberals, but because they are on average more intelligent than conservatives. They are therefore more likely to attain the highest status in any areas of evolutionarily novel modern life. Of course, as with any other broad empirical generalizations, there are exceptions. Liberals do not control every single organization in every single area of life. However, the balance is far from equal, and the overall bias is pretty obvious. For example, in the area of the mass media, AM talk radio is predominantly conservative. However, it is only one of many mass media channels. Newspapers, magazines, TV, radio, movies, the internet, etc. And all other mass media exhibit a strong liberal bias. In fact, as I elaborate later in Chapter 10, while AM talk radio is conservative, FM talk radio, mostly NPR, is very liberal. Among cable TV news channels, Fox News is relatively conservative, but it is only one of many cable TV news channels, all of which are entirely liberal. So it is safe to conclude that liberals control most organizations in most areas of life, even though the American population in general is mostly conservative. If liberals are more intelligent than conservatives, why are liberals so stupid? While it is consistent with the prediction of the intelligence paradox, the conclusion in the previous section that liberals are on average more intelligent than conservatives may not resonate with most people's daily observations and experiences. If they are more intelligent, why are liberals, especially those in Hollywood and academia, so much more likely than conservatives to say and do stupid things and hold incredulous beliefs and ideas that stretch credibility? Bruce G. Charlton, professor of theoretical medicine at the University of Buckingham and former editor-in-chief of Medical Hypotheses, may have an explanation. In his editorial in the December 2009 issue of Medical Hypotheses, Charlton suggests that liberals and other intelligent people may be clever sillies who incorrectly apply abstract logical reasoning to social and interpersonal domains. As I explain in Chapter 3, General Intelligence, the ability to think and reason likely evolved as a domain-specific evolved psychological mechanism to solve evolutionarily novel problems, whereas for all evolutionarily familiar problems, there are other dedicated psychological adaptations. Everyone, intelligent or not, is evolutionarily designed to have the ability to solve such evolutionarily familiar problems in the social and interpersonal domains as mating, parenting, social exchange, and personal relationships with the other evolved psychological mechanisms. Charlton suggests that the totality of all the other evolved psychological mechanisms, all of human nature except for general intelligence, represents what we normally call common sense. Everyone has common sense. Intelligent people, however, have a tendency to over-apply their analytical and logical reasoning abilities derived from their general intelligence incorrectly to such evolutionarily familiar domains and, as a result, 
get things wrong. In other words, liberals and other intelligent people lack common sense because their general intelligence overrides it. They think in situations where they are supposed to feel. In evolutionarily familiar domains such as interpersonal relationships, feeling usually leads to correct solutions, whereas thinking does not. I personally dislike Charlton's term, clever sillies. I don't like the British usage of both words, clever and silly. But otherwise, I completely agree with his analysis substantively. As Charlton points out, common sense is eminently evolutionarily familiar. Our ancestors could not have survived a single day in their hostile environment full of predators and enemies if they did not possess functional common sense. That's why it has become an integral part of evolved human nature in the form of evolved psychological mechanisms in the social and interpersonal domains. As I explain in my last book, despite all the surface and superficial differences, all human cultures are essentially the same in broad and abstract terms. There is only one human culture, and part of the common human culture is common sense about how to behave and how to treat each other. So not only do individuals from different ethnic, cultural, political, and class backgrounds in the same society share common sense, but so do all peoples of the world. Notice that common sense only pertains to evolutionarily familiar and relevant aspects of social life, not evolutionarily novel aspects. There is no common sense about how to boot up a Macintosh computer or how to fly an airplane, although there is common sense about how to behave in a computer lab or in a crowded airplane, which is the same as how to behave in a crowded cave. Common sense is thus evolutionarily familiar. Because common sense is evolutionarily familiar and thus natural, the intelligence paradox would predict that more intelligent people may be less likely to resort to it. They may be more likely to resort to evolutionarily novel, non-commonsensical, stupid ideas to solve problems in the evolutionarily familiar domains. If this is not paradoxical, worthy of the name, the intelligence paradox, I don't know what is. This, incidentally, is the reason I never use words like smart and clever as synonyms for intelligent. Similarly, I never use words like dumb and stupid as synonyms for unintelligent. Intelligent has a specific scientific meaning, possessing higher levels of general intelligence measured by a series of cognitive tests or heavily G-loaded tests like Raven's progressive matrices, as I explain in Chapter 3. In sharp contrast, smart and stupid have more to do with common sense intelligence. From my perspective, more intelligent people like liberals are more likely to be stupid, lacking common sense, whereas less intelligent people like conservatives are more likely to be smart, possessing functional common sense. Yes, more intelligent people are stupider, and less intelligent people are smarter. If this is not paradoxical, I don't know what is. Matt Stone and Trey Parker, the co-creators of South Park, get it perfectly. In the episode, Go God Go 12, The Wise One, the elderly leader of Atheist Otters, don't ask, you have to see it, says with reference to Richard Dawkins, Perhaps the great Dawkins wasn't so wise. Oh, he was intelligent, but some of the most intelligent otters that I've ever met were completely lacking in common sense. Charlton's concept of clever sillies and the intelligence paradox can explain why general intelligence and the capacity for common sense may be negatively associated across individuals, and why people like Richard Dawkins are simultaneously very intelligent and very stupid, lacking in common sense precisely because they are very intelligent. As the pioneer evolutionary psychologist Gordon G. Gallup Jr. puts it very eloquently, in science, common sense is often common nonsense. Higher intelligence as a peacock's tail?
There may be other reasons why intelligent people like liberals tend to espouse stupid ideas. The Norwegian-Australian journalist Mads Anderson in personal communication suggests to me another explanation for why liberals are stupider than conservatives. Anderson has a couple of great suggestions, both of which utilize the handicap principle, first proposed by the Israeli biologist Amas Zahavi. A prime example of a handicap is the peacock's tail. The long, elaborate, and ornate tail of a peacock does not have any adaptive value. It does not serve any tangible, useful purpose that would aid the survival of the peacock. In fact, it only harms its survival chances. Peacocks with longer, more elaborate trains are easier for predators to catch and kill than fellow peacocks with shorter and simpler trains. It is also biologically more expensive to maintain elaborate trains with symmetrical eyes, so they only have costs and no benefits. But that, according to Zahavi, is precisely the point. Peacocks are advertising to pea hens. Look, I'm so genetically fit and I can run so fast that I can still evade the predators with this huge thing hanging from my ass. Them other guys ain't so fit, and the only reason they can evade predators is because their trains are shorter. They wouldn't be able to evade the predators if their tails were as long as mine. Now whose genes would you like your offspring to carry? And peahens indeed do prefer to mate with peacocks with longer, more elaborate, and more symmetrical tails that are biologically very expensive to maintain and costly for their survival chances. Peahens prefer such peacocks as mates so that their male offspring will also sport long, elaborate tails that attract females of their generation. The same idea is captured by the expression fighting with one arm tied behind my back. Any fighter who can win a fight with one arm tied behind his back would naturally have to be stronger and more genetically fit than anyone who needs both hands to fight. Zahavi and other biologists suggest that many seemingly useless traits like peacock's long tails may have evolved as a handicap an honest signal of one's genetic fitness to potential mates. They are therefore sexually selected. They increase the carrier's reproductive success even though they are not naturally selected. They do not increase the carrier's survival chances. Anderson's ideas capitalize on the Zahavian handicap principle. First, he suggests that more intelligent individuals tend to espouse absurdly complex ideas as an honest signal of their higher intelligence. Because common sense is evolutionarily familiar, and all humans are equipped with common sense, it is, by definition, the simplest and easiest solution available to them. More intelligent people reject this simplistic solution offered by common sense, even though it is usually the correct solution, and instead adopt unnecessarily complex ideas simply because their intelligence allows them to entertain such complex ideas, even when they may be untrue or unuseful in solving the problem at hand. Many observers have noted that this is indeed already happening in academia. In fields like literary criticism that lack external objective criteria for evaluating ideas, in contrast to natural sciences whose theories must be evaluated against nature, or in pseudoscientific fields like sociology where nobody can agree on what the truth is, and political ideology trumps empirical evidence, academics are increasingly rewarded for proposing complex and absurd ideas like reader response theory or social constructionism. Anderson suggests that these academics may be unconsciously saying, look, I have such an excess of intelligence that I don't have to go for the obvious and simple, albeit true, answers provided by common sense. I can come up with absurdly complex ideas because my higher intelligence allows me to. Second, Anderson points out that many political liberals, especially in Hollywood and academia, are themselves well off and do not individually and directly benefit from the liberal policies of greater welfare states. 
Once again, these liberals may be giving an honest signal that they have accumulated and are still able to accumulate so many resources that they can afford to pay higher taxes and allow the public funds to benefit other people. If they are not able to accumulate resources themselves, they would not be able to afford paying higher taxes to fund welfare programs that do not directly benefit them. In essence, they are, unconsciously, saying, Look, I'm so wealthy that I can afford to waste my money on other people who are not related to me. I believe Anderson may be right in both of his suggestions, but I don't think his explanations necessarily contradict the ones offered by Charlton and myself earlier. Instead, they may be additional reasons why intelligent people are more likely to be liberals and espouse stupid ideas as honest signals of their genetic fitness and higher intellectual capacity.